We want to thank everybody for joining us today in what is going to be our final session for the virtual crop talk series. So I want to thank everybody for joining us pretty much the entire month of February and, and on into March here and, and appreciate you taking part uh, in all of our sessions. So, um, of course, we could not do this without all of our agents that are on the team. Um, and we'll run through those just because they have, without this team, these sessions would not be possible. So Emily Benningsdorf up in Thomas County, Aaron Highland in Rollins, Keith Van Skyke in the Quinn, Quinn Creeks District, Cody Miller in the Phillips Rooks District. We also have Sandra Wick up in the Post Rock District, Craig Dinkle in Midway District, Stacy Campbell in the Cottonwood District, myself, Chris Long here in the Walnut Creek District, Clint Bain in the Golden Prairie District, and then of course, Jeannie Falk Jones. Jeannie's not gonna be with us today, but uh, she was a, a very integral part in all of these sessions. So Jeannie being up in the, she's multi-county agronomist up in the Sunflower District. So again, wanna thank every all of these agents. At any time, if you have questions or anything to follow up with, at the end of our session, feel free to contact any of them and they'll be sure to help you out. Um, as we're going through the session today, if you do have questions, you can go ahead, if you're on Zoom, you can go ahead and plug those into the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen and type them in there and our presenter or one of the agents will bring that up at the end of the session. If you're on YouTube, you can also type your question into the comment box. And to do that, you'll also have to, you will also need an account. So make sure you've done that as well, but you can type that into the chat box and you'll be good to go there. You can also email your questions. If you don't have those two options, you can email your questions. I know here on the screen, it does say um, Jeannie's email, but with her not being on today, you can email those to Sandra Wick at swick at ksu.edu. We'll probably throw that into the chat box here in just a minute as well. Oh, Craig has already done that. Swick at ksu.edu. Thank you, Craig. All right, we're gonna, we do utilize, and I know Lucas is going to be using this later on in his presentation. We do have the poll everywhere um, that, this is going to be interactive. There are going to be questions asked and you can plug your responses in. Um, if you've been following us the entire series, you've done this before. If you have not, the instructions are here. Open your web browser and go to pollev.com slash KSU, or you can simply text KSU to the number 22333. So those are your instructions there. I'll give you just a second to get that brought up before we go into our first question. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump to that. Next, so our test question. Yesterday, everybody had plenty of wind. So what was your wind speed yesterday? Already we're getting some high numbers there, 11 to 25 miles an hour. I would say we were pushing for a little over 25 down here. So it looks like the majority so far is at 11 to 25 miles an hour at 80%. It was moving yesterday. Hopefully, didn't have too much soil moving around. Up, nope, jumping up to 83%. So we had a windy one. I think today is supposed to be a little bit better um, and even have a little bit of moisture, hopefully, by the end of the week. So... With that, my PowerPoint was acting up a little bit there. 
So I'm going to go ahead and reshare my screen. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right. Let me close out of the poll everywhere. Maybe that will go away. Again, I apologize. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Those of you that are needing CCA credits, you have two way of doing that. Um, if you, again, if you've been on here before or throughout the series, you can email genie at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. And at the beginning, you'll want to email at the beginning and at the end of the webinar. You'll need your name and your CCA number to do that. Or you can scan the QR code that will be posted on the session here or at the end of the session with your certified crop advisor app at the end here so we'll be able to with the app we'll get your cca credits um, either one of those two routes will work all right we're going to get ready to hand it over to lucas today we do have dr lucas haig and he is going to discuss corn dynamics lucas is the northwest region agronomist with K-State. Lucas serves 29 counties in the northwest and north central part of the state with applied research and extension in crops, range, and soils to improve the productivity and profitability of your of the ag industry. So with that, I'm going to stop mine and turn it over to Lucas. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, can you hear me and you can see the slides? Yep, sounds good. All right, so appreciate that and appreciate uh, those of you who took time to, to join us today. I know it's a really nice day today and things to be doing out in the field. So uh, we're, we're a small group today, but uh, we'll try and hopefully uh, share a few things that, that you might find worth your time. So just want to give an update uh, and some of this we would have uh, discussed at the Cover Your Acres conference here a few years back and some of the management work we were doing focused on dryland corn uh, but wanted to provide uh, uh, more of an update and uh, and some of the new things we're working on and and uh, some some of the data from this past year. So we I don't need to show this. Chris already got everyone up and rolling with with the polling. We'll use that a few times here. Um, actually, we're going to start here, and so this is, uh, you can just text, uh, text your answer, uh, but the question is, how many years have you been planting dryland corn? And so you can just text, uh, uh, just text that number to that So yeah, it's so kind of interesting, the numbers that are coming in, we really kind of have this, uh, and, and this is, I think, fairly typical. We've got some areas in, in the territory I cover where dryland corn's been a fairly, uh, has, has been around for, you know, 20 years or so now, and, and we've got to still see uh, quite a few uh, new growers uh, coming into to corn. And so uh, it's always interesting to how that, that we get some different perspectives. So I would ask, especially for those of you that have been dry, growing dryland corn for an extended period of time, uh, you know, in general, if you think about the hybrids you're using today in terms of maturity, uh, today are you planting hybrids that are longer in maturity, about the same or shorter uh, than what you would have been planting, say, 5, 10, 15 years ago whenever you started growing uh, dryland corn? All right, give just a minute in case there's any more to come in. Yep, 
Okay, so most of you are saying you're planting something longer. Uh, several of you saying the same, and, and I'll be honest, this surprises me a little bit. We'll come back to this a little later in the presentation, but you know, there's really been, uh, at least what I can detect, a little bit of a, a push. Uh, you know, in the industry, there's been a lot more uh, moving people towards shorter season varieties, uh, or at least that's what I, I sense, maybe more so here in the immediate uh, in Colby area. And, and we'll show some data later on that I think is worth thinking about in terms of maturity and, and hybrid selection. Okay, so if we think about what's changed over time, especially those of you who have been planting dryland corn for 20 years or so, uh, you know, we've really seen this decline in, in what's called ASI or anthesis silking interval. And if you think about today, we've got a lot less in the way of uh, pollination issues. Uh, you know, there's much more reliable, even in, in the face of heat and drought stress, we don't see near the issues with pollination that we did, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. And, and that's really been an effort in the industry to shorten up with this anthesis silking interval. So basically we're talking about how many days delay is there uh, from when the corn tassels uh, to when uh, the silks actually appear. And so by shortening up that lag, uh, you know, we're, we're making sure that, that pollination process is more in sync and we're less susceptible uh, to, to heat and, and drought. Uh, the other thing here, increased resistance to barrenness, and this goes into our, our thought process about seeding rate. You know, it used to be uh, if we planted corn too thick for the environment, we would typically see barren plants as, as a result. And, and what we see in the hybrids today and, and what's really been interesting, especially some of our dryland trials, here in Northwest Kansas, we're, we're running some rates on up as high as 27,000. Very seldom do we actually see a barren plant. It might not be a great ear, uh, but we generally see every plant at least setting, setting an ear. Much, much different than uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago when we would have had a much higher incidence of, of barrenness. Now, barrenness can still happen, obviously. If we have enough stress, um, we, can, we can certainly see that, that response. <clears throat> We have seen improved yield potential of short and mid-season hybrids, and you know, a lot of that is, is the industry is focused on uh, expanding corn acres into the northern plains. There's been a lot of development work that's gone into that, you know, 90 to 100, 100 105 day class, and our mid uh, mid-season hybrids, that 106 to 110 day range, has really seen a lot of advancements in terms of their yield potential. <clears throat> So I want to spend just a little bit starting off talking about seeding rate and some of the works we've been doing there. And, and this really goes into the bigger picture of how do we implement variable rate seeding from a precision ag standpoint. And, you know, one of the things I think we sometimes forget is, is that, you know, these hybrids that are, that are on the market can have vastly different response curves to seeding rate. And so you know, understanding that is important if we're actually going to do be effective at writing a variable rate seeding prescription. Um, this is complicated by the fact that we've got fairly rapid turnover of hybrids. And so by the time we tend to get uh, comfortable with a product, familiar with how a product uh, responds in our environment, it's likely gone and, and been replaced by something else. And so that makes it that much more difficult to, to have some comfort with the products that we're using. We know that yield components uh, flex differently and at different rates for different hybrids. There's fewer companies publicizing any type of ear flex scoring of their products. And, and this has always been kind of a fuzzy term. There's real no strong definition in terms of what is ear flex, how do you quantify it, uh, and how do you score it? It's always kind of been each company's had their own way to characterize that, uh, which, which has made comparing products across companies somewhat difficult. <clears throat> So just some of the on-farm work we've, we've done, uh, we've had multiple years of trials, this dry land up in Decatur County. We're typically running around 38 hybrids and we would plant as low as 8,100 and as high as 27,000. And so you might say, well, God, why, why that wide of a range? We know 8,100 is too low and we know 27,000 is, is too high. And, and, and that's certainly, certainly correct. But what we really wanna tease out is out of these different, these wide set of hybrids, how do they respond uh, differently to, to their environmental conditions. If we've got a good year with a good amount of resources available, what's the ability of that hybrid to flex to meet that environment uh, and, and, and take that good situation and turn it into yield? <clears throat> so we're measuring yield, uh, kernel rows, kernels per row, kernel weight. These studies uh, typically are in the neighborhood of 800 to 1100 plots, individual plots in size. 
we'll go through in each of those plots, pull out five years that we, we count Colonel Rose, uh, Colonel's Prior row, and then we measure uh, Colonel weight on, and then we machine harvest the plot to get, to get yield. Here's just an example of some of the wide ranges of, of uh, responses we see in the field. Uh, so each of these photos is off of five plants. And so, you know, here on the, on the left-hand side, we've got these five really nice size ears, obviously a, a, a non-prolific hybrid because we've completely filled these ears, but we've still only got five ears. So one ear per plant, so, so non-prolific. As opposed to the image up here in, in the upper right, uh, a more prolific type hybrid, where basically we're setting, you can see one primary and one secondary ear per plant, but still filled pretty nicely. And then of course the image in the lower right, uh, which we'd rather not have, where we really got this hodgepodge of primary ears and then these secondary ears that really didn't, didn't amount to anything. <clears throat> so a wide range of, of, of responses that, uh, that we've seen in these, in these studies. Here's just an example of a couple. Uh, here's four, four hybrids that I picked out for an example here. So here is grain yield on the y-axis versus seeding rate. So as we go from 8,100 on up to 27,000, we can see uh, these dashed lines represent the different, uh, the response curves for these four different hybrids. And a couple of them overlap pretty tightly. Uh, so you really can't see it. But if we look here, this difference between hybrid 30 here in the red and uh, hybrid six and hybrid 11 over here in the blue, what I want to point out here is, okay, at this 150 bushel yield level, uh, there was a basically a 5,000 seed per acre difference in terms of what was required to hit that 150 bushel yield level. <clears throat> and at, uh, you know, between two and three dollars a thousand for seed, uh, you know, the seed cost of this is, is not insignificant. You know, we're talking, uh, you know, two bucks a thousand, we're talking ten dollars an acre uh, on up to maybe 15 bucks an acre. Uh, spread here for the same the same yield goal. So what can we learn about these hybrids uh, in terms of how they respond and, and can we pick that apart? So here's just an example, uh, just looking at a histogram of, of the hybrids, uh, the nearly 40 hybrids we had in 2018, the range of optimal seeding rates. Now I'll, I'll couch this, uh, my caveat here is 2018 was a spectacular yield year in terms of dry land yields in Decatur County. And so we've got really high optimal seeding rates in this single uh, site year, you know, saying, hey, we probably should have been planting a lot of this at, at 24,000. But just looking at the range, we've got everything from 20,000 to, to 34,000. And even in our drier years, we see that where we've got some stuff where the optimum might have been 12,000, but there's also some stuff where the optimum was 24. That's, that's a huge, uh, a huge range to try and, and cover. So we've talked about prolificity. Uh, we know that we can get flex from Colonel Rose, Colonel's pre row, Colonel Weight, and then we'll revisit the whole issue of, of tillers. So here's kind of comparing, uh, you know, or this is looking at a single hybrid. And so the blue diamonds represent yield per plant, okay? And that's on the left-hand axis here, that's pounds of grain per plant. And in the, the, the red uh, blocks here represent the overall grain yield, and that's on the right-hand axis. So keep in mind, as seeding rate goes up, yield per plant actually goes down, okay? But how do we get to yield? Well, we've got yield per plant times the number of plants gets us to yield. And so it's really about understanding these relationships of as we increase seeding rate, how fast am I giving up yield per plant? And the rate at which I give up yield per plant as seeding rate goes up is what really drives these different uh, seeding rate response curves that we see in the field. <clears throat> now, I'll say I think of all those treatments we've put out, uh, the one that I, I feel like we're learning the most from is when we go out and plant this corn at, at 8,100 plants per acre. Because you really get a feel for what's the capability of that plant to set productive tillers? What's the capability of that plant to set multiple ears uh, per, per main plant? Um, What's its ability, you know, for 8,100 in most years, it should not be resource limited. We should max out kernel rows, kernels per ear row. And so you really get to see what are the capabilities of, of that particular hybrid when it's not resource limited. And so here's uh, just one particular year of the study. Uh, these, each diamond represents a hybrid. These are all planted at 8,100. And so we see a range in yields from 85 bushel an acre to 121 bushel an acre all off of 8,100 seed drop. 
And so that really tells you there's a wide range out there in terms of a plant's ability of an individual plant to make use of its resources. And so what I can tell you is down here at this 85 bushel mark, these are generally hybrids that are non-prolific. Uh, they're gonna set one year per plant period, uh, regardless how many, how much resources it has available to it. And so obviously that really caps your yield potential as opposed to at these higher yield levels when we're raising 120 bushel corn off 8,100 plants, those are plants that are prolific. Uh, they set, uh, you know, multiple ears per main stock and they, and they tend to do a good job of filling those ears. So as we also look at that, so, so this is another way of looking at, okay, what's driving this yield per plant? So here's ears per plant looking versus yield per plant. So not surprisingly, as yield per plant goes up, part of that's being driven by, by ears per plant. So in other words, the ability of these hybrids to set multiple ears. Kernel rows, uh, actually fairly flat. And again, go back to think from a, from a growth and development standpoint, when are we setting kernel rows? Well, that's at the V5 stage. And so really, um, you know, should not be resource limited at that stage. And kernel rows is largely genetically driven. And so we see that differ amongst hybrids, um, but really not a real strong relationship from kernel rows to, to yield per plant. Now we do see a bit of a relationship, not surprisingly, as yield per plant goes up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong slide here. This is total kernels per, uh, kernels per plant. Kernel rows slightly increasing positive trend. And then uh, finally looking at kernels per ear row, um, as yield per plant goes up, kernels per ear row actually comes down. Now that seems very counterintuitive at first, but if you think about what's happening here, as yield per plant goes up, part of that's being driven by ears per plant. So we have more ears out there, but those ears are becoming slightly shorter, okay? Uh, we see average number of kernel, kernels per ear row going down, but in some cases they're becoming slightly fatter too. We tend to see a higher number of kernel rows. So we've got all these dynamics at play uh, in terms of as we're adjusting seeding rates and that plant has a different amount of resources available to it, how it's, how it's responding. <clears throat> uh, and same way kernel weight, uh, you know, tends to, tends to go down a little bit as yield per plant goes up. We've got more kernels, uh, so they tend to be uh, a little bit uh, lighter weight kernels. They don't fill as, as, uh, as completely. <clears throat> okay, so back to this chart we showed earlier. Here's these two hybrids, 5,000 seed difference to get that 150 bushel yield. You know, what's, what's really driving that? Well, so, you know, basically it's back to this idea of yield per plant is declining faster uh, in, in this hybrid with the, uh, than it is this one. So that really shifts what, what that optimal seeding rate should look like. How can we tease some of this out from an on-farm approach? I really think one of the biggest indicators to think about is how does, he, how does this corn respond at the far extremes of, of seeding rate? Very often when we're looking at doing on-farm trials, we don't set our rates wide enough. A 2,000 uh, seed per acre difference isn't likely to show a response, especially if we're trying to measure that with a combine yield monitor. We really need treatment strips that are at least 300 feet long, uh, multiple locations in the field, and you know, one thing I'll point out, this is some work we did uh, down in, in Stanton County a number of years ago. You know, if you've got some highly variable ground, we can use that uh, to our advantage to get a, a better feeling for, uh, for this. So here's a field, um, you know, that had been uh, leveled at one point for flood irrigation. So we see a really strong difference in soil texture gradient across that field. We can use that to our advantage by laying in the seeding rate blocks uh, on those different uh, soil types. And so within this one field can really get a look at all the, uh, all the different soil types that the grower might have across his entire operation. So if we've got that information, we can, we can use that variability to set up these treatment strips. You know, and part of this is coming back to how do we put this in a variable rate seeding script? Uh, you know, one way of thinking about that is, you know, thinking about a normalized yield gold. So you've got a map of yield, yield potential or yield goal for your field. That's what I would use to drive my variable rate seeding script. And so I might say, okay, uh, you know, on average, and here I've got two different, uh, you know, this is an irrigated example. Let's fast forward to a dry land example. Um, here I've got two different hybrids, more of a flex steer and, or more of a, a fixed steer hybrid, okay, where we know it's going to take a little higher seeding rate to get there. 
I might say that, hey, my field average is 100 bushel. And with this hybrid, I'd need 16,000 seeds to hit that. As opposed to this more fixed eared hybrid for that 100 bushel, I'd need more like 19,000 seeds. And then you set a range You say, okay, I've got, maybe I've got some sand pockets in this field. I've got some areas that maybe only have a 50 bushel yield potential. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I would plant those at about 12,000. Maybe the best ground, I've got some really good deep silt looms in one end of the field and I'm gonna push that ground. It always produces well and I need 20,000 seeds to hit that. And so it's really just a matter of saying, okay, what are my endpoints here for this particular hybrid versus my range of, of yield expectations in the field? And then it's just really a matter of, of fitting a, you know, we can do this in Excel, just fit a regression to it. And now you've got an equation you can plug into, you know, if you're using SMS or Ag Studio or whatever software you're using, can then stick that equation in there using your yield goal map and to generate that variable rate seeding script. But part of what helps us determine these endpoints is looking at these hybrids in the field at an 8,100 seeding rate, at a 27,000 seeding rate, and seeing how do they respond across that range. And, and that's what helps us dial in these, these endpoints to build this relationship. <clears throat> so my recommendations for doing this on farm, I'd really encourage you, even if you don't plan on making it big enough uh, to harvest with a combine for yield monitor, still just the observational value, um, you know, just do your planner with by even 150 feet. Um, and maybe you go from, you know, put some, put some little blocks out that are 8,100, that are 27,000. Uh, on irrigated, I, I like to go from 12,000 to 50,000. And, and even just to have these from an observational standpoint, you know, if, you're, if your seedsman says, hey, I've got this new hybrid that, that we're going to have more of next year, you know, I can get you a plot bag of it. This would be a good exercise to do with, with some of those things that, that you might be planting next year. Do that next against your most popular hybrid on the farm and get a feel for how they respond differently uh, across seeding rates. Here's the thing to really keep in mind, and this is what we see at that 8100 rate. What we learn there is, you know, when you have a non-prolific hybrid, if it's only going to set one ear per plant, you're, you're going to leave yield on the table if your seeding rate is too low. Because if it's not prolific, it doesn't have that ability to flex up uh, to meet the, the environment in a good year uh, because yield per plan is maxed out. We've got the biggest, fattest, heaviest ear we're going to raise and we can, we're only going to do one per plant. And so we've got to make sure we match, uh, you know, make the number of plants match our, our environment. Here's a, a good thing to look at is if, if yield per plant is the same as you go from 8,000 to 14,000 or say if you go from 8,000 to 16,000, and your yield exactly doubles, that's a pretty good sign we're still maxed out in terms of yield per plant. And so uh, we wanna make sure we're, if we're using those hybrids that are non-prolific, we wanna make sure we've got a high enough seeding rate that we're not capping ourselves and leaving yield on the table. Um, okay, so we talked about prolificity, all the yield components here, but what about turn, uh, tillers? We'll take a bit of a turn here. So we got a poll question for you. Tillers and dryland corn, what's your gut reaction? If I ask you what your thoughts about tillers are? Well, okay, option A, heck yes, the more the merrier. I like tillers. Uh, B, I'd rather not have them, but yeah, okay, shoulder shrug. C, I don't care at all. Or D, I will not plant a hybrid if I see that it tillers. It's kind of an interesting question because uh, uh, people have tend to have very strong opinions on this. I tend to have a strong opinion on it, but actually in the research literature, we don't have a lot of data uh, that really points us towards what the, uh, what the right answer is. And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit next about some work we've got looking at that. So a little bit of background, and here's some of the earlier work we have. This would have been done at Tribune uh, back in the mid-2000s, uh, where there was 18 different hybrids in a study, and, and was basically looking at um, what are common characteristics for, for corn hybrids that do well in a dry land environment, okay? Uh, and, and a lot of different things were measured in that study, but just focusing on the tiller piece of this, um, and this is looking at ears with grain. And I apologize, this is in, in metric, but I've got the standard units here. So uh, 50 
a uh, thousand years per hectare would be equivalent to roughly 20,000 per acre. So the 30 comes out to roughly 12,000 per acre. But in general, the, the take home message here is, and this is in 2005, six and seven, the reoccurring trend is, is that as tiller population goes up, uh, number of tillers per, per acre uh, goes up, the number of years with harvestable grain tends to decline. And so on average, what this worked out is, uh, is basically about a third of a bushel per acre for every thousand tillers per acre. Okay, so, so say, uh, for example, if you're planted at 17,000, uh, that's basically saying one tiller per plant uh, would be reducing, if, if every plant had a tiller on it, you'd be reducing yield by about five bushel an acre. Okay. Um, now, one of the limitations here is they, they just looked at tillers. We didn't look at whether those tillers were actually contributing any yield or not. <clears throat> so this is one of the few data points uh, that we have, but really it's pretty, uh, pretty empty out there. So uh, next I'll be showing some slides from Rachel Veenstra. She's a graduate student uh, working with Ignacio C. and Petty uh, in the agronomy department at K-State. And so they have this project uh, in conjunction with Corteva and uh, and then we're, I'm hosting one of the locations for it uh, here at, at Colby. And so uh, Rachel's got some real nice pictures here, you know, but if we think about tillers, we've got, you know, really three potential development outcomes. So we've got, you know, vegetative tillers, which I think those are the ones we most often have a negative connotation with in our mind, because we know we're burning water to grow this biomass that's, you know, may or may not uh, be contributing to our productivity. You know, one of the things of, of, I guess one of the things I hear out of the, the pro tiller crowd, so to speak, is, well, we've got the ability to relocate, uh, you know, in the grain fill process, we can relocate resources out of these vegetative tillers and, and help with grain fill. And so, and there, and there is some of that translocation that happens. Uh, however, that's an active process. It requires energy to do that. So we're back to what is that trade-off? What's it cost us to remobilize uh, that assimilate that carbohydrate from the tillers into the grain. So vegetative, and then of course tassel ear, you know, and the challenge there is how much harvestable grain do we really get out of those? We probably recover some of it, uh, but not likely, uh, not a very large percentage in it, and it tends to be pretty low quality grain, right? Uh, if, if we get it harvested. But what we do see though sometimes are these lateral ears where actually we do set some productive ears on tillers. And I think this is where the hybrid interaction really comes into this is, is it a hybrid that's more prone to setting, if it does tiller, is it going to set these lateral ears or are they gonna be vegetative or tassel? And so there's a huge hybrid interaction in here, but then also an environmental interaction too. You know, tillering is a plant response to saying, hey, Life's good, the environment looks great. I've got plenty of water, I've got plenty of nutrients, I've got plenty of sunlight, I, I should do something with it. Um, and so we've got this interaction of environment in terms of what's the environmental conditions like when we've got these opportunities to tiller, uh, what's the hybrid piece to that, and then what happens to the environment after the fact? Do we start setting all these tillers and then things turn off tough? Uh, what, what happens then? Okay, so here's uh, the plots that we've got with Rachel. Uh, so we've got three densities out there, 10, 17, and 24,000. This, this is all dry land, okay? So we've got those. Uh, we got looking at two different hybrids, so 0657 and 0805 from Pioneer. And then we've got a couple different tiller treatments, and Rachel's really focused on either leaving them intact or removing them at V10. Uh, we've got another treatment at Colby where we're removing them at V5 because I think, uh, I think it's important uh, to, if we're looking at that difference between tillering and not tillering, I wanted uh, one earlier step of removal uh, in there to look at. And so we're basically going through on hands and knees, uh, pull, literally pulling the tillers off the plants uh, out of the, the treatments that we're removing them from. And uh, just leaving them, uh, leaving them in the row. And so you can see here, you know, this is a, a pretty stark visual of, you know, this hybrid. I don't know exactly which hybrid this is, uh, but you know, there's a lot of tillers in there, and you don't really notice how much leaf area, uh, how much biomass the tillers are adding to the whole picture until you go through and yank them all off and leave them laying in the row. 
And so uh, it kind of a, kind of real and interesting, just, just visually, uh, it really drives home how much biomass there can be tied up in these tillers. Okay, what about yields? Uh, so here's the average uh, across multiple locations. These are across the dry land locations. Uh, so here's at 10,000, 17,000, 24,000 plants per acre. The green bars represent leaving the tillers intact and the, the yellow bars represent uh, where we went in and removed the tillers. And so at these two higher seeding rates, no significant impact on yield, whether the tillers were left in place or removed. Uh, and at this lowest seeding rate at the 10,000 plants per acre, we actually see higher yields uh, with, with leaving the tillers in, in place. And so then again, this is a hybrid that's got that ability to actually set some productive ears, some lateral ears. And so we do have the ability, you know, obviously look at our yield levels in here, you know, we're talking 120 to 170 bushel dry land corn. Uh, you know, obviously 10,000 plants per acre is probably too low, right? We're not capturing uh, our yield potential out there. And so, but, but with the, the tillers, we are able to make up for some of that. Um, so they positively uh, changed yields at the low seeding rate or had no effect at the, at the two higher seeding rates. But there's a limit to how far tillers can compensate. Notice that um, in these, uh, you know, even with the tillers, um, you know, we're still at 144 bushels, statistically not different, but numerically we're still 10 bushel off, 12 bushel off, uh, from what if we would have planted it at 17,000 to begin with, or for this particular year, you know, what if we would have planted it at 24,000. So there is a limit to that, that compensation ability that we can get out of these tillers. And, and I would argue this is fairly hybrid specific too. I think uh, a different hybrid could give us a quite different answer on this. Okay, so 2020, uh, this is a limited irrigation site over at Goodland, so much higher yield potentials with some timely rains involved. Uh, but, you know, here we are, 24,000, we're up 220 bushel corn, 17,000, we're raising 200 bushel corn. Uh, but again, seeing a pretty good contribution to final yield from tillers uh, at this lowest seeding rate. Um, you know, again, we're, you know, basically tillers are bringing, uh, you know, basically 70 bushel to the table. Uh, so moving on. Okay, so Colby low yield environment, and this would be actually in uh, uh, a continuous corn situation, dry land corn on corn. Uh, and so in this situation, uh, no difference from tillers either left or removed on, on any of these. And so, and I guess in my mind, this is the environment, you know, when we're talking at 100 bushel and 100 bushel less, that's the environment where I guess if, if tillers are causing us a negative effect, I would start to, I would expect to see that to start uh, showing up. But we, in 2020, we, uh, we did not see that uh, here at Colby. Okay, so looking at uh, percent of our harvested ears, where did they come from? And so this is uh, the various seeding rates across the top. So 10, 17, 24,000. Uh, and not surprisingly, as we go to higher and higher seeding rates, a larger percentage of the ears are coming off the main, the main plant. Not surprising there. And it's really only at the 10,000 rate uh, where the tiller lateral ears are, are having a significant contribution. The exception to that's Goodland at the 17,000. And keep in mind, this is limited irrigation. Uh, you know, we're still, even at 17,000, about 20% of the harvested ears are coming from those lateral tillers. Only at one site, and this is in far eastern Kansas, so uh, near Manhattan, so not really dry land per se, um, but there, for whatever reason in that environment, seen a much higher percentage of tassel ears uh, come into the mix as well. Okay, uh, so the main takeaway so far, at least in, in Rachel's study here, tillers have never reduced yields regardless of the yield environment. I would, I would couch that though with the fact that these have been fairly high yield environments. Almost all of them have really basically been above 100 bushel and quite a few of those are significantly above 100 bushel. And so uh, hopefully, I say that tongue in cheek when I say hopefully, but uh, you know, a mix of some tougher dry land environments in there would sure be nice to kind of round out our, our view of this. Equipment, or excuse me, environment and resources available to the plant are important for, for both tiller appearance and then whether that till, tiller actually develops an ear. Uh, obviously, lateral ears are preferred for tiller development. They're the most likely to contribute grain. Uh, while tillers do have the potential to boost yields of low populations to match higher densities, 
mainly observed in these higher yielding environments, and there's a limit to that. Um, you know, as we saw in several of those examples, planting at 10,000 and relying on tillers is not necessarily going to get you to the same place as if you would have planted 17,000 to begin with. So anyways, and Rachel likes to say maybe corn tillers aren't suckers after all. So something, something to think about and hopefully we'll continue to get uh, more, more data on that, on that topic. So I'm going to round this out with just a little bit of discussion on some hybrid maturity uh, and, and uh, seeding date, planting date work that we've been doing. Um, so this has primarily been at, at Colby and Tribune. We also was able to capture one year of data uh, up near Smith Center and one year of data near Olmutz. We're hoping to get back in the rotation and, and do some of those on-farm trials again. Uh, it just kind of depends on, on funding availability and, and uh, our ability to to uh, put some fuel in the truck. So, uh, so we're gonna start with this question. Um, if you could plant all of your dry land corn on one day, what would it be? So you could enter like 5-31 or 5-31 if, uh, if, if May 31st would be your magic date. But if you could plant it all in one day, uh, what would be that magic day that you would choose? The golden, I had uh, an ag engineer, the uh, teacher that always talked about this when he's talking about sizing machinery. It was the golden moment. Uh, if you could plant it all or harvest it all at, at that golden moment, what would it be? And the problem with asking this question is we probably, I'm guessing we have a, a wide range of geographies on the call today as well. And so that, uh, uh, is probably driving this in part also. Okay, so, oops, whoa, what'd I do? Okay, so there we go. So yeah, pretty uh, nice wide range of responses. And so that kind of mimics uh, the range of planning dates that we've been looking at uh, in this trial. Okay, now the second part of this question. Um, now on that magic day of planning, what length of hybrid would you be dumping in the planner? in terms of uh, relative maturity, in terms of days. On that magic day of planning, what length of hybrid would you be dumping in the boxes? Okay, so not surprisingly, along with our, our range and planning dates, we've got quite a range in, in uh, hybrid maturities uh, that folks would be, would be using. Okay, so the background to this, uh, really our only dry land corn planning date research was done uh, in Western Kansas was done in the early to mid 90s at, at Garden City. Uh, you know, we hear a lot from producers and I've, I've experienced this myself, sp specifically out here in Northwest Kansas, you know, seeing improved yields from later planting. And we've got a bit of a conflict there in terms of what our RMA final plant date is. And so we really want to ask the question, is this, a, is this real? Is it just a function of our recent years? Um, and how does hybrid maturity uh, play a role into this decision? Because it's really not just planting date. We've got this whole planting date hybrid maturity uh, interaction uh, that, that plays a role. You know, so there's a couple different planting date philosophies. And so uh, we've got some that are there may be more defensive and so we think about early corn early and in the early days of dry land corn in western Kansas that was talked about a lot uh, was, was early corn early and, and obviously uh, I would argue still is the predominant strategy especially in south central Kansas uh, where their soils warm up a little faster they can get an earlier planting date um, and they're trying to beat the heat really is what is what the strategy there is. Uh, We've talked about, and we've heard, uh, you know, shorter season hybrids to reduce water use. And, and, and that certainly is true. I think I took those slides out. We've been measuring water use in some of these studies. And it is true that shorter season hybrids do reduce water use, um, but there's trade off there. Typically, if you're using less water, um, you're also raising less yield. And so then it comes into the, the, there's a timing game part of that as well. I think the, the strategy that uh, I see taking a little more acres out west here, at least what guys have in mind as we're moving this planting date later is maybe we're planting medium or even in some cases medium full season hybrids later with the idea of getting grain fill on the other side of the heat. Uh, especially at our higher elevations, we really start to cool off in the evenings. 
Uh, so can we, uh, can we get our grain fill on the, on the other side of the heat? Um, and then there's always the offensive approach. And that is I'm gonna plant the longest season hybrid that the environment can support. I'm shooting for max yields. I'm not worrying about water availability. I wanna maximize my light interception and my ability to convert that into grain. So there's some different philosophies, some different strategies involved. Uh, what's changed since we've started growing dry land corn? I think about, you know, we've got a lot of guys in Northwest Kansas been growing dry land corn for, you know, 20, 30 years now. Um, certainly the, the companies have made huge progress and improved cold vigor and emergence. Uh, you know, cold, cold emergence scores are, are often part of the company literature now. You can often get the actual cold germs from your seedsmen. Uh, and that's especially important for our no-till systems going back into heavy residue, stripper head wheat stubble, cover crops, whatever. Uh, the yield competitiveness of mid and short season hybrids has improved. It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg, again, as companies have tried to move further in, move the corn growing area further up in the Dakotas and even into the prairie provinces. Been a lot of focus on, on the performance of those mid and short season hybrids. Um, we've seen some reduction in ear flex and full season hybrids. Um, and, I, and that concerns me because I think ear flex is a key uh, a key attribute we need for performance in our, in our highly variable environments. And so there's been a bit of a move away from that and more towards uh, the development and release of more de uh, deterministic uh, uh, hybrids, fixed ear hybrids. Uh, climate variability, yeah, our climate's variable has been for a long time. Um, and then machine capacity's changed a lot. You know, how many acres are we trying to cover per row? How many acres per day? You know, uh, that, how am I trying to spread that machinery investment? How many day planning window am I typically running over? Okay, so a little bit uh, walk through history here. Here's 2019, our RMA plant dates. This is what's really driven us to start looking at some of this. Uh, you know, we were at a May 31 cutoff for the vast majority of the state. 2010, they moved that back to May 25th. And that's really when some of, a lot of our producers were put in a bind because uh, we got a lot of acres of corn dry land still going in after the 25th and, and people actually wanting to move more that direction. Uh, 2017, still on 25th, uh, we did some heat unit modeling work and, and, and submitted that to RMA. And I think at least I've been told that at least played some role in getting them to move that planning date for far western Kansas back to May 31st, starting with the 2018 year. And that's basically where we're still at uh, today. Uh, it's for basically these western four or five tiers of counties being on May 31st, the bulk of the rest of the state on the 25th, and then we're still May 15th down here. But again, this is the area where we're talking about early corn early really being that, that uh, optimal strategy. Okay, so one thing, I, uh, we've, we've talked about this a lot over the years, but uh, predicting probabilities of success, this is where we've used some historical weather data to look at cumulative heat units from planting to, to a killing freeze for various planting dates and hybrid maturities. We're using book value GDUs to black layer, and we're assuming those are, are correct and stable. And there's, uh, there's obviously a lot of fuzz around that, but this is our, our best shot at it. So here's an example of one of these tables. Uh, these are available on, the, on my website. Uh, I've got these for 50, 60 locations in Northwest, North Central Kansas. We also pull in some border locations uh, from Colorado and Nebraska. Um, but you can hear and basically you look across the top by planning date versus the relative maturity or, or whatever, the, or if you got the GDUs on the hybrid, you can pick your closest GDU. Here's the probability of getting this number of heat units in between from the planting date until first freeze, okay? So you can kind of see, you know, for a given planting date and a given hybrid maturity, what's my probability of getting enough heat units? Um, when you open this file, there's, there's uh, some narrative in there. Make sure you read that. There's some disclaimers. Uh, I'll tell you just in general, I think these are very conservative uh, estimates. Um, so it's, you know, you can kind of take several locations, blend them together, adjust them a bit, but it, it's at least a starting point. So feel free to look that up on, on the web. You know, when you get on the fringe, things change pretty fast. And so here's a June 12th planning date. Let's just look at the 30 miles from Colby to Hoxie. Um, 108 day corn planted June 12th. Uh, we're saying it's got a 60% chance of finishing at Hoxie and a 21% chance of finishing at Colby. Uh, but there's just that much difference in those 30 miles due to elevation, due to temperature, that when you're, when you're starting to ride the edge, 
uh, and it can really shift things uh, pretty fast. And again, those, those seem kind of low, but I you can read the details. These, these are conservative estimates. Okay. But, you know, so we did all that, but ultimately we still short of, of field data. And, and uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And uh, we try not to do that. Um, so our goal is to evaluate a combination of maturities and planning dates and ask the questions, is there an advantage to planning later? Do hybrids adjust when planted later? And, and ultimately the goal is to create a solid data set that we can use for some crop modeling. Everything was done no-tilled into wheat stubble except for one year at Barton County that went into bean stubble. Uh, we was dro we're dropping 17,000 seed at Tribune and Colby <clears throat> and 19.5 at Olmitz and Smith Center. Here's uh, the hybrids we used in 2020. We've had a few change ups in here, but by and large, this is the package of hybrids we're, we're using. We went to three different companies that we knew had completely separate genetic pools so that we weren't getting anything relabeled or related to each other. Um, so we went to Pioneer, AgriLine, LG, and then uh, uh, Monsanto, DeKalb, or now uh, Bayer, I guess, but, but the DeKalb and Channel Lines. So we knew these were three distinct uh, genetic pools. We said, hey, we need a short, a medium, and a full season hybrid. And so, and, and really all the results that I'll present, we're averaging these together, okay? So we average these three hybrids together to give us our short season yield. These three hybrids get averaged together for our medium season yield, and these three get averaged for our full season yield. And that way, the, the danger of doing this, we could have went and just done this with three hybrids, one short, one medium, one long. But if there's, for some reason, a hybrid doesn't do well that year, or I did a poor job of picking a hybrid, well, now all of a sudden you've really unfairly biased all short season hybrids just because you did a bad job of picking a hybrid that year. Um, and so I, I think this is a much more fair approach is to get this uh, subset across the industry and then, and then take the average of it. Okay, here's one of the things that's probably been interesting from a phenology standpoint. Most book guides will tell you it takes 900 to 120 or 100 to 120 GDUs to get to emergence. You know, our high residue, cooler soils, especially early on in the season, uh, it, this is a Tribune, it's taking us quite a few more heat units sometimes to get that corn up and out of the ground. Now I will say, I like to plant corn deep, okay? These book values came out of the corn belt. I assume they probably came out of tilled soils and I'm gonna bet they're planting their corn a lot shallower than I am. And so uh, again, you know, just, just a, a reminder that we got to keep all these things uh, in mind. Okay, so we'll look at some of the individual years here. Smith Center 2018, uh, really nice corn yields that year. Uh, all these are laid out the same as you move from left to right. Blue is the short season hybrids. Uh, orange is the, is the mid season, gray is the full season. And then the yellow is the average across all nine hybrids in the study. So that gives you an overall view of the yield environment for that planning date. Um, interestingly, so if you look at uh, from the early May on out through the early June planning, basically flat when you average all the hybrids together. We see the performance of the full season hybrids start to drop off a little bit. The mid season basically flat. Uh, the short season we pick up a little bit. Now by the time we're out here to mid-June, still pretty respectable yields, and these all did black layer uh, that year, but uh, and really not much of a difference between maturities when we get out to that latest planting date. But certainly uh, early May at Smith Center that year, there was a huge advantage uh, to planting those full season hybrids, and that really persisted. And even on June 1, uh, there was no advantage. And I guess here's this is going to be a reoccurring theme. Oftentimes we get in a late plant situation. There's, you know, sometimes people get really concerned about, I need to roll to a shorter season hybrid. And I think what you'll consistently see uh, this shorter season hybrid group, there's no real clear advantage to rolling a lot of acres to it, even once we get out into a June planning date. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the key take homes out of this. Barton County. So again, I think this kind of reinforces what we've seen there was, you know, early corn early. Uh, but, you know, even then we're still getting some nice yield responses out of the full season hybrids. It really isn't until, you know, the June 1 planting date that stuff really starts to flatten out a bit. And then certainly by, by the mid-June planting date, then we are giving up some yield out of that, out of that full season hybrid. But even early on and in, in, in mid-May, we're not getting a huge response to, to that short season hybrid. In fact, it's, it's back quite a few bushel. Um, 
So, you know, the early planning seems to be panning out at this one site year data, um, but uh, we didn't see that benefit to using an early maturing uh, or short season hybrid. Okay, Colby 2018, we did have moderate hail on June 30th. Uh, we do see slightly, uh, you know, our highest average yields were at this mid-May plant date, but really not much different uh, on, on June 3rd, really statistically really no different when we look uh, across the hybrids here. Um, still a nice response, even on June 1, um, you know, our mid or our full season hybrids beating our short season ones by, uh, you know, 20 bushel or better. And so we're still not seeing that. Now, obviously, we get out to mid-June, these full season ones. Uh, you know, we, we dropped off quite a bit of yield and we, uh, these are pretty low test weight too. We had a lot of these that didn't meet uh, black layer. Uh, here's this last year at Colby, 2019 we lost due to wind damage, uh, 2020 at Colby, uh, you know, really fairly flat, but even here on June 3rd, uh, interestingly, no difference between our short season and our full season hybrids. Um, and that's really uh, when our shortest season ones did the best. If we're mid-May, you know, we're sitting back quite a bit on these, these short season ones. Okay, now here's our most complete data sets down at Tribune. Alan Schlegel and his guys there have been terrific and working, uh, working with me on this project. So here's 2018, and here's kind of, uh, you know, real classic response. They also get an earlier date down there. And so uh, here we are mid-April. That's or planting early at Tribune in, in 18 was not the answer. Here's mid May. You know, really mid June, where we're maximizing our yields, getting a nice response to hybrid maturity there as we go from the short to the full season hybrids. Pretty flat, but very respectable yields on this, uh, you know, end of May, 1st of June date. And then here, you know, we just know we're getting pretty short in our environment. 19 much flatter across the board. In general, a slight decline in yields with later planting. Did not see very big differences amongst hybrid maturity. Pretty flat, really, not particularly exciting. Although, you know, really never does the short season hybrid uh, really knock, knock our socks off on anything. Okay, here's this last year at Tribune. Um, you know, kind of this flat line response out to mid-May. And then we did give up some yield going to the to first of June and then mid-June. So this is kind of the most dramatic response we'd seen, negative response uh, to the late planning. Here's averaged across years. Uh, and if we average across hybrids, our optimum's showing up in about this mid-May. But, you know, still not bad early June. Early June's no worse than early May. And I guess that's maybe one of the other take home here is this is a fairly wide window. And so hopefully we can continue to work with RMA to say, hey, uh, there's really no more risk on June 1 than there is May 15th. And so can we widen this window uh, out a little bit? So take home message, you know, in general, our planning gate response is generally flatter, I think, than a lot believe in, in a number of our locations. I don't think that's true everywhere, uh, but a fairly wide window. Planning in early June, seldom worse than early May and sometimes better. Barton County, and as we move further south and east, uh, likely to be exceptions. Here's the thing I think really is worth thinking about. Um, and I think we've seen more acres moving towards shorter season hybrids. Certainly that's, there's some very popular products in that maturity group, but at least in our data, the short season hybrid group did not have a yield advantage in any environment and often left yield on the table, even at a June one planning date. And so, uh, you know, if we get into a late plant situation, I really think we need to hold the reins back on rolling to shorter hybrids. And I think, uh, uh, and, and just in general, uh, maybe look at uh, the portfolio of products we're using on our farms and, and uh, are we getting a little heavy on the, on the short season side. Uh, a given combination isn't always gonna be the right answer. The real question is what hybrid by maturity minimizes risk and maximize profits over the long term. Um, max yield in any individual year doesn't really tell us that. And so that's why our future steps with this is to hopefully do some crop modeling where we can plug in 100 years of weather data and say, okay, based on what we observed in the field in these years, uh, 100 years of weather data, what's the, what's the best right answer over time? That's, that's where we want to go eventually. Uh, thank you for your support. If you've been an attendee for Cover Your Acres, you've helped fund this work. We've been unable to get funding from the, 
the corn commission or other other venues and so we try and rob some dollars out of cover your acres to do this work and really thank our partners at, at pioneer lg and dekalb channel have been very generous in, in their in providing seed and their expertise and uh, really appreciate their partnership on this and, and, and many things. all right sandra i'm over time you're rolling out the gong to, to usher me <laughs> off the stage so okay. All righty. Well, thanks again, Lucas. Uh, I know I always have lots of questions on planting dates, rates, um, uh, especially out here, not only out there in northwest Kansas, but out here and or here in north central Kansas, too. So it looks like we had some questions coming in on the Zoom. So uh, Craig's been monitoring that. Uh, so, Craig, you want to begin on those questions? Yeah. Uh start off with on the planting date and probability charts how how low a percentage would you go uh, he thinks it's kind of a personal choice but is 60 to 70 percent probability still reasonable plan or should he go higher yes that's a good question josh and I, i'd say you know just in general those uh <clears throat> Those charts I present are, are uh, you know, on the conservative side. And so in that narrative, if you go to the website and open up that, there's that PDF there, I kind of walk through a little bit of that thought process and how what I would do is for a given uh, planning date hybrid combination, I would kind of look, okay, uh, look around that and see how sensitive of an area in the chart you are and say, okay, well, what if, what if I actually, you know, planted something a little shorter, a little earlier, does it change that probability much? Uh, and kind of just take a blended feel, not only on that, that intersection of the chart that you're on, but kind of look around that and see, okay, how steep am I here? Now, if you're fairly in a fairly stable area of the chart, I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable with that than, hey, if I'm right on the edge of where this thing's really dropping off steeply, uh, then, then to me, that's an indication there's a little more risk involved. And, and it doesn't hurt to look at multiple locations either. Um, you know, if you're in between two or three locations that we have on that chart, I'd kind of take a blended average of them because there can be some pretty stark, as I showed just between Hoxie and Colby, you know, there's a huge difference there. So I would, I would blend, you know, some of the locations that are closest to you. All right. Uh, do you have individual results for each of the hybrids? Uh, yeah, we do. I'm kind of thinking through how we're, we're gonna, um, do that, you know, it really wasn't set up to be a, a hybrid trial. We were just trying to have representative uh, things. And so that's why we've really been focused on presenting these maturity groups. Um, I think, you know, that's something moving forward. I think we may look at, uh, you know, maybe I we need to visit with our industry partners and see how much appetite there would be. But, you know, we've traditionally done these, these hybrid performance trials and I, I think they've kind of limited utility, but maybe we need to change shift and actually do some some management trials, and then we could offer some of this management by hybrid data, uh, actually in a, in a hybrid performance test type scenario, so. All right, got one more here. On the GDU to germination, you said you like to plant deep, uh, how many inches? Yeah, so I, I will not plant corn shallower than two and a half. Um, and actually my best, most, you know, when we're doing, uh, you know, emergence scorings every 12 hours, um, you know, my most consistent stands have come from a depth of three inches. They're not fast emerging, but they're uniform. And uh, I, would, I would rather have uniform over fast almost any day, um, you know, in terms of getting all those plants up. You know, that's something, there's a lot of talk about plant spacing and yeah, that's, that's important. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it gets a lot of attention because there's a lot of dollars of stuff that can be sold on plant spacing. If you look at the agronomic literature, what's by far more important than plant spacing is uniformity of emergence. And uh, by planting deeper, if you think about the variability in a field, think about variability in soil moisture, soil temperature. As you go deeper in the soil, uh, just think if you could have a map of soil moisture or soil temperature for a field. And think about what that map would look like at one inch depth, two inch depth, and three inch depth. That map's going to look more uniform the deeper you go, right? And so by planting deeper, one of the things we're doing is we're putting those seed into a much more uniform environment. And so I think that's, that's uh, 
uh, one of the reasons uh, we, we see more uniform emergence. It might, it might be slower emergence, but it's going to be more uniform. And so, uh, but I, I have no heartburn planting to three inches, especially with the quality. I mean, seed quality has come so far in the last 10, 15 years in terms of vigor and emergence out of cold soils. Yeah, Jay, that's a that's a great comment as well, and that's that's part of why we wanted to use multiple hybrids in this because we know, uh, you know, that's one of the things that gives me a lot of heartburn. I think back to some of the research I've done over the years. I think back to all of the uh, clump and skip row corn work that we did at, at Tribune for a lot of years. By and large, it was all done with one hybrid, 33B54, because it was a really popular dryland corn, but. Um, it does make you wonder on some of these studies, if we would have done it with a different hybrid, how different would have our results been? Because we know all these hybrids respond differently to environment and management. Okay. All righty, well, thanks again. It doesn't look like there's any more questions coming in. So if you do have a question or you think of one after we get off here, just go in and email your extension agent and we can get those to Lucas or you can uh, email those directly to Lucas. Um, whichever one is just fine with us. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions. I will turn it on back to Chris. All right. I think we already had the question pop up into the Q&A box, but for those that are needing the CCA credits, here is the QR code for today's session. Again, if you did it by email, um, you would want to should have emailed Jeannie to start the session, and then you can go ahead and email her now if you're doing by email. If not, if you want to do the QR code, here is that for today's session. So leave that up there for just a couple more seconds. I'll let you folks go ahead and get that in. All right. Now I believe. It looks like Craig has already posted the link the, for the Qualtrics survey. Um, we do appreciate you going ahead and completing that questionnaire and survey. It gives us some information to help guide us for future programming and some other information, um, some of our reporting responsibilities with this as well. Um, so if you can, please log into that link that is there in the chat box and complete that short survey. It's not gonna take you very long. Gives you, it's gonna have a bit of an evaluation to help us out. Um, it is also in the YouTube chat box as well if you're joining us on YouTube. So again, please fill out that information. Shouldn't take but a couple of minutes and it's very valuable information to help us with all of our future endeavors. So. Um, do want to thank you for participating in all of our sessions. If whether you joined today, whether you had us, you know, on for a couple sessions, whatever it is, we thank you for participating in all these sessions over the last month and a half or so that we've been doing this. Um, again, thanks to all of the agents to help make this possible. If you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to contact your local extension office or any of the agents that are involved with the sessions here in the last six weeks. Um, you know, if you have any questions for a particular presenter, we can contact them as well. If you didn't get their information at the end of their sessions, whether it was Lucas or any of the others, we could, we'd be glad to help answer whatever questions there may be. So again, thanks for all participating. Sandra, did you have anything else? Uh, one other thing, if they miss some of the sessions, those recordings are posted along with the handouts at several different locations. Yes, should be able to find those. I know here in the Walnut Creek District, um, those usually get posted up on our Facebook page by the end of the week. Um, some of the other local units are doing similar items, maybe might even find them on their um, local unit website. So again, if you missed any sessions, you want to go back and find them contact your local extension office. They'll be able to help you out with where those might be located if you are not already following them on social media or uh, accessing their website regularly. So, yep, join us for any of those. 
And again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. With that, that is going to be it for today. Again, thanks everybody, and thanks to the agents for doing this. Um, and Stacy has even thrown on there the Northwest uh, area or regional office for these sessions as well. The recordings are there, handouts are there. Um, go back, find whatever you need, and we'll go from there. So appreciate it, and we will catch you guys later. Thanks. <laughs>